Robert Floyd Miller, Bob, was born in Flint, Michigan to Floyd and Clara Miller on January 8, 1925. His father was of German descent and mother was Polish. In 1925, Flint was largely an automotive blue collar town and his father worked as an electrician at the Buick assembly plant. His mother worked primarily at what was then McLaren Hospital. They grew up in a very meager and very strict Catholic household. And at a very early age, both Bob and his older brother Edward learned the value of hard work by shoveling sidewalks and sweeping the floors of small local companies. He never remembers a day in his childhood when he didn't have a paper out. It was always assumed that young Bob would go to work at Buick when he graduated from high school. As an avid sports enthusiast, Bob Miller became a very talented baseball pitcher. While playing on his high school team, his talent was recognized and he was watched by scouts as a potential candidate for the Detroit Tigers farm team. Also during high school, at the age of 16, while working in an ice cream parlor, he met Margaret Eleanor Hawes, who was a Protestant, much to the dismay of his parents. He was valedictorian and class president at Flint Northern High School, but was never able to officially graduate with his class because at age 18, he was drafted into the army. By March of 1943, he left Flint and headed for boot camp training in Georgia. Boot camp was tough for a young man in his teens who had just left the only home he'd ever known. Sarge would often throw recruits rifles into the red Georgia muck until they sank and were buried and then the new recruits had to dig them up and clean them. After boot camp, Miller was briefly stationed in New York City, awaiting orders. In November of 1944, he was shipped out to the front lines. His service number assigned was 3658801, and he was a private in the Army Corps of Engineers with battalion, combat, and special troops training, and headed for the European Theater, Belgium. Arriving at the front lines, he stood six foot one and weighed 176 pounds. In late 1944, in the wake of the Allied forces' successful D-Day invasion of Normandy, France, it seemed as if the Second World War was all but over. But on December 16th, with the onset of winter, the German army launched a counteroffensive that was intended to cut through the Allied forces in a manner that would turn the tide of the war in Hitler's favor. The battle that ensued is known historically as the Battle of the Bulge. The courage and fortitude of the American soldier was tested against great adversity. In December of 1944, during an intense skirmish at the Battle of the Bulge, Bob was waiting to cross a bridge with a group of engineers when they were bombed. A hand-to-hand -hand combat ensued, and a German soldier smashed his rifle into Bob Miller's face, breaking his cheekbone, teeth, and nose. Bob Miller, age 18, was captured on December 12, 1944, and was marched for days to a POW camp at Stalag 4B in Muhlenberg, south of Berlin. By Christmas of that year, his parents received a telegram stating that Private Robert Miller was missing in action. Later in life, he would recount to a VA nurse the terrifying initial interrogation he endured when he arrived at the prison camp. The soldiers were stripped of any personal belongings or photos they had, given a tin can for water, and subsequently over the next several months became severely malnourished. The soldiers constantly wrapped their feet in what paper they could find, prior to putting their boots on to try and prevent frostbite. The days inside the eight foot by 11 foot cell where he lived with three other men were long and frigid. The continual forced marches thinned the weakest and the rationing of food became increasingly brutal. Over 3,000 men died from tuberculosis and typhus. At the time of his imprisonment, there were 8,414 other prisoners of war at Stalag 4B in Muhlenberg. In the midst of all this hardship, they had few saving graces. The Red Cross sent food packages to them on a regular basis, 
but oftentimes they did not receive them. But when they did, they knew they could make it to another day. The packages contained life-sustaining food, cigarettes, and books or games to pass the time. They were allowed to practice their faith, and they played sports, especially baseball, to pass the long days. Early in 1945, word reached the POW camp that the war was nearing an end. It was, however, the Russian troops that were beginning to drive out the Germans. The POWs began to see Russian, as well as a few U.S. planes, fly over the prison camp. Trusting the Russians less than the Germans, and having limited information, Miller and a couple of his fellow soldiers devised a way to escape. During the early days of the Russian takeover, German security began to wane, and defection of the German soldiers at the Stalag was rampant. One night, Miller and two other POWs decided to take a chance, and they slipped past the guards. The three POWs ran for miles until they were totally spent. With very few of their belongings and no food or water, they slept in barns to keep warm. By using the sun's direction, they laid out a plan to reach the French border, where they felt they might find safety. The following day, they stole three bicycles and began pedaling. They would sleep during the day and travel at night, periodically stopping, begging for food and water, and then continuing their journey. They encountered other soldiers who had been prisoners as well, trying to make their way to the American lines. On one of their days on the road, Miller recalls stealing a bottle of vodka, which they traded for a meal. After several days of riding, and near total exhaustion, they reached a small river. As they stood on German soil, they realized that they had arrived at a crossing into France. Hundreds of people, mostly Germans, were attempting to flee into France. U.S. soldiers, who were strong allies of France, were checking people before allowing them into the country, with no time to waste. Miller and his fellow soldiers climbed on the bridge and attempted to cross. As the U.S. soldiers began to aim their rifles in their direction, Miller yelled out, who was the most valuable player in the 1944 World Series? When later asked why that question, he replied, only an American would know the answer. Looking puzzled, one of the soldiers asked, well, who was it? To which Miller replied, Joe DiMaggio. The U.S. soldiers smiled, lowered their rifles, and waved the trio across. On April 23, 1945, Private Robert F. Miller, weighing 125 pounds, crossed the bridge into France. Until April, his parents were unsure of their son's fate. Shortly after his escape, they received a telegram that he was alive and in rehabilitation for his low weight, exposure, and frostbite to his fingers and toes. The three U.S. soldiers who escaped together returned to America and eventually their homes to recover for a short time. Their war ordeal was horrifying and something they consciously chose to try to put behind them, saying goodbye the three men agreed never to speak or contact each other again. To this day, they have kept that promise. After rehabilitation, Bob Miller spent his last few months of enlistment in sunny California, overseeing young pilots in training. At times, he would comment that he spent most of his last days in the Army bringing the boys home from the bar, which was a far cry from Stalag 4B. Miller eventually reunited with Margaret Peg Hawes, and they were married on October 25, 1947. Peg often recalled the nights when she would pace the floors with Bob, working through his post-traumatic stress episodes that would keep them awake. Committed to more than a line career at Buick, he attended and graduated from what was at that time the Michigan State Agricultural College, and was hired by General Motors. He attended the General Motors Institute 
and launched a 40-year career in personnel and public relations at GM that took him to several areas of the United States and eventually many countries around the world. He never offered to talk about his POW experience and only once told his complete story to one of his children's high school history classes. Occasionally, when a child or grandchild would ask him a question about the war, his response was short and hushed. And only now, with his memory fading from dementia, his World War II experiences are some of the most vivid things he will recall from time to time. And to this day, he has never quit being one of the Detroit Tigers' biggest fans.